So this is a book that acknowledges that we're in a climate crisis, that it's a tragedy, um, an ongoing tragedy that has been going on um, for a very long time. And now we're at this kind of moment where there is actually an opportunity for a response, not just to the climate part of it, but possibly and hopefully to um, colonialism and exploitation and a lot of other things. And so the book holds that, um, but is also talking about uh, techniques to repair the climate and what kind of social organization they might require. Um, so part of it is really delving into the science. Part of it is looking at the people producing the science and the entrepreneurs kind of putting this as a part of the agenda. Um, and what their interests are, and um, what are the p possibilities for climate repair and restoration? Is it possible to restore the climate? If so, shouldn't we try? <laughs> We're in a climate crisis. This is a climate emergency, and it's increasingly being recognized um, by people, by politicians, by corporations, even slowly and quietly. So. I expect that as that awareness continues to grow and people are search for solutions, these technological interventions into the climate system, which have been um, lumped together under the category geoengineering, will be debated and proposed. And so far, the left has basically quite reasonably said, we don't want those technological interventions into our complex climate system. Um, under capitalism, that's going to be a disaster. Um, because we've seen what's happened with things like biofuels, for example, and how those have impacted people in the global south with land grabs and that kind of thing. And we've seen that forest carbon offsets were a disaster. And so based on this and all these other experiences, why would we want something like geoengineering? And this book kind of covers all of these different techniques mostly focused on techniques for removing carbon from the atmosphere. So that, that can be done by storing it in ecosystems and soils and trees. It can also be done by building industries that take it from the air and sequester it underground. So injecting carbon dioxide deep underground to store it. And the response to that has largely been, um, we don't want that technology. Natural climate solutions might be okay, we might really need those, but no geological storage. And so the book explains why, unfortunately, we're at a point where geological storage um, might be necessary and might actually be a, a means towards climate justice if it was done under a different regime that we have now. So um, it's typical to see, to fear that these technologies would be a substitute for mitigation, which is a fear that I share deeply. Um, it's very easy to say, see how companies would be like, well, we can slow down on mitigation because we're going to just suck the carbon out, right? Um, and I think we have to engage with it anyway, despite that distinct possibility and keep that from being what happens, because that's the default. Um, and I think that these technologies have some promise because if the carbon is underground, it's not in the atmosphere where it's hurting people around the whole world. Um, I think the climate's safer that way. The climate could even be restored to some extent that way. So I start out by talking about bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration because that's what's been used in the models. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, indicated that um, to keep warming below 1.5 degrees, there would be a huge amount of carbon removal via bioenergy with carbon capture and storage because that's what they put in the models um, because bioenergy is familiar and carbon capture is familiar. So starting out with that, the issue with, with that is the demands for land. Um, and then I look at afforestation which is probably the most familiar of these things. I look at um, soil carbon sequestration, which has a huge potential and it has a lot of benefits for farmers. Um, but the potential has also kind of been overstated in some cases. So I discuss all of that. Um, and then I move to talking about geological carbon um, removal methods. And the 
the latter part talks about something called solar geoengineering, which is um, blocking incoming sunlight to cool the earth and the different ways some researchers are thinking about that. And the reason I include that in the book is because um, if mitigation isn't working, if we can't get carbon removal working, people will probably call for solar geoengineering at some level. So one thing I try to make clear in this book is that the current economic system we have, capitalism, is not going to be able to accomplish this. It's not going to be able to accomplish removing carbon from the atmosphere because carbon is essentially um, a waste product that polluters can throw up there for free. And um, even with a price on that carbon, it's not clear that that's necessarily going to achieve the level of removal that are in these uh, models for keeping climate to below 1.5 degrees. Um, it's just such a massive project. It, it would involve building out the, an infrastructure that's basically the same scale as the existing fossil fuel industry with its wells and um, pipelines and all this stuff, but for putting carbon back underground. So huge infrastructure project that I don't see capitalism being able to take on, right? Um, it's going to involve a huge amount of state intervention and, in that case, public support and engagement um, because it's going to cost a lot if it ever gets built. Um, it's going to require a tremendous amount of renewable energy. So it's not a substitute for renewables in that way. It, in fact, it implies building out even more renewable energy than we would need. Um, so a lot of the policies that are been incorporated in talk of the Green New Deal about decarbonization would actually be similar to the policies we would need for large-scale carbon removal. These really go hand in hand in a lot of ways. So I actually meant after geoengineering in two senses. One is looking at the long term and what happens after these technologies are used and how can they be ended. Um, but I also meant in terms of after the word geoengineering, like this is a word I think we actually need to put out of service because it's vague, it doesn't get to the huge variety of things people mean. Um, and so can we talk about carbon removal? Can we talk about solar geoengineering? Can we talk about all these things in a more granular way? People have really focused on geoengineering in terms of should we do it? What kinds of technologies should be used? what's going to you know, force us to start it. And there hasn't been nearly enough thought about what an intervention looks like throughout the long course of it, um, how that would be managed and negotiated, and how it would eventually be ended, which I think and hope would be the end goal, is to use these technologies to stabilize the climate system, to buy more time for mitigation and all that infrastructure and social transformation, and then stop doing them and have it be really an, an episode of history where we kind of pulled together some of the tools we had and muddled through um, while preserving as many ecosystems and species and human well-being at, and didn't have a war and all these other things to kind of to get through a crisis point and how what's our long-term vision of what a world might look like in one or two or three hundred years after this period of reckoning with the climate crisis. And so this could be one small part of a much broader response uh, that includes, you know, phasing out animal agriculture or changing that food systems because that's a huge contributor, um, getting off of fossil fuels, changing our transportation, changing our built environment. One part of that might involve some of these technologies. So this book includes speculative fiction because I've been thinking about embodied futures. We see all these lines on these graphs and that doesn't really tell us what it feels like to live in one of these worlds. And it also highlights the choices about the social organization and how they are so critical to the experience of what it means to live in a different climate future. This book begins with a choose your own adventure type sequence where the reader is navigating different choices that lead to different climate futures. Um, and I wanted to include that to showcase that there's not just one type of two or three or four degree world. There, there's a lot of different climates with different social organizations and it's very different to live in each of those worlds.
Right now, we're at one degree of warming. We're seeing terrible impacts from wildfires to heat waves to hurricanes, and that's going to just multiply as the world warms. Um, what will start to kick in uh, pretty soon, at, you know, by mid-century and, and more, is sea level rise. So that'll begin with intermittent flooding during high tides in a lot of coastal cities. At two degrees, there's a world that decides to just, you know, be authoritarian and delay and do nothing, or there's a world that decides, you know, let's go full scale Green New Deal with carbon removal, and we mean it, and we're gonna do it. <laughs> and we've, you know, <laughs> that's the, the social choice there. There could be a world at three degrees that just, um, you know, falls apart and there's kind of this kind of post-truth uncertainty about what's going on and different authoritarian leaders make use of that. Or there could be a three degree world of renewed cooperation that decides to embark on a solar geoengineering program. There's so many different uh, worlds and it really depends on, you know, the social choices we make, the political choices we make. Scientists have been calculating a carbon budget, which is how much um, additional emissions can accrue before the world is locked into, say, a two degrees temperature rise. So that may be 1,000 of these gigatons, right? Which would mean that we would spend out that carbon budget at a rate of 40 to 50 per year by sometime in the 2040s. But the carbon budget may be less, it may be 700 gigatons, which in, in case we, we reach it in the 2030s. And so that time of being locked into that level of warming is really soon, I mean, very soon. <laughs> so, so that's why the, the clock is ticking, that's why you've heard about these 12 or 11 or 10 years left. Um, it's because of that carbon budget. That's why people are talking about drawing down carbon one reason is to extend that budget a little longer. The other is that it would um, allow for what's called residual emissions, and this is the really tricky part, and this is why people have been critiquing net zero as a goal, because net zero assu assumes that there are continued residual emissions throughout the century, and that the carbon removal is used to compensate for those resi residual emissions. So what we on the left need to do is enter that debate about who gets these residual emissions, what sectors um, can it be people in the global south who haven't had as much time to develop their economies with fossil fuels the way we have. I mean, there's a lot of political questions in that debate around negative emissions technologies and residual emissions that's wrapped up in net zero and hasn't yet been uh, unfurled. So in this concept of climate restoration, there's a lot of talk about reversing climate change. And you might have heard about that in the context of drawdown, the idea that some things are reversible. There's even some groups suggesting that we need a new target level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So right now it's getting you know, 410 parts per million and increasing. Some people say 350 would be good. You might have heard that. Some people say pre-industrial concentration of greenhouse gas is like 280. Um, and so with massive carbon removal, that could be a conversation that occurs. And so with a lower greenhouse gas concentration, um, then impacts like heat waves, for example, might be less frequent or might be more analogous to the climate we had, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, right? So some of those climate system impacts um, would change again from what they've already become. Um, other things like melting ice, it's difficult to build that back up quickly um, because a lot of the ice that's been lost is really old ice. <laughs> so a lot of the ice that's still left in the Arctic is this very new ice that regrows each um, year. Um, the, the climate impact that is really concerning is species loss, and that's something that doesn't come back. So can we reverse climate change by bringing down greenhouse gas concentrations? There's a, it's very nuanced. Some things are reversible, other things are forever. It's easy to be really narrow or reductive when look, 
talking about carbon, especially this kind of mathy carbon stuff and counting the carbon and everything. But a lot of carbon removal techniques um, would intersect with some of the larger ecological challenges. I'm thinking particularly about um, soil fertility and the interventions made into the nitrogen cycle. So that's something that carbon removal policy that thinks about soil carbon could also address those challenges at the same time. Because this crisis is much, much bigger than climate. It's about extinction. It's about other planetary boundaries like nitrogen and fresh water and plastic pollution and other um, you know, chemical pollutants. It's, there's so much wrapped up in the ecological crisis. Some carbon removal techniques um, would intersect with those, others less so. It's very easy to see a path, which is probably the default path, where this technology is developed by elites for the benefit of elites, um, for the profit of elites. And I think there's another option. What if these technologies were um, democratically controlled, democratically researched and governed and collectively owned? Can't we, don't we have the imagination to think about what that might look like and the responsibility to think about what that might look like, um, not just for our generation, but for all the future generations. People think about engineering the climate. So is our relationship now to the natural world just one of engineers where we're controlling everything and dominating and mastering? Um, and that's in the word geoengineering, which is part of why I think it's a terrible word. Um, I don't think that these technologies necessarily involve that type of relationship. I think that with imagination, we can imagine carbon removal um, in particular, perhaps even solar geoengineering, that takes a different stance in relationship to the natural world, that thinks about we are intervening in this system, but we're doing so with an ethos of care or tending and listening and being responsive and recognizing um, a certain place that isn't one of domination or mastery.